Hey guys, this is Patrick coming to you deep in the heart of No Shave November. We're going to see how it goes. Shepard asked if uh, we would like to publish this chat that he had with a climate scientist on our channel, to which I immediately responded, yes, of course. And we would love to publish anything that you have to offer on Disenthrall. So uh, thanks to Shepard for what you're about to see. This is an interesting talk with a client si uh, cli climate scientist that is uh, getting some traction on some mainstream news outlets. This will be an interesting discussion, and I uh, appreciate Shepard for providing it to us. For those of you watching, uh, we are continuing to get removed and shadow banned. Our Facebook, we were, our ownership of our Facebook page was just removed finally, so that happened. Publishing content like this, this anti-establishment, anti-mainstream narrative content comes with risks, and the risks are that we're constantly fighting to be able to bring our message to you, and we're also completely unable to depend on the normal income streams that most of these other channels benefit from, like YouTube monetization, for example. So if you enjoy having access to this sort of side channel conversation that most people aren't allowed to have by the powers that be, please consider supporting uh, the channels that you appreciate the content from. <laughs> so if you want to support Disenthrall, you can do that at disenthrall.me slash support. Thanks, guys, and enjoy this conversation. Well, hello, Paul. I guess it's afternoon for you. It's morning for me. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Okay, fine, fine. I'm, I'm responding. I've just been on live television in the UK, well, live national television, uh, debating with an alarmist. And um, so I'm just dealing with all the ramifications of that. And it looks like I'll be on there more, more than once now. Uh, I think they're going to be using me to counter the narrative. We have a, a new television channel in the UK, um, which has taken off, um, and it's called GB News, and it's spouting, uh, it's allowing freedom of speech. And, and that's unusual, actually, these days. The West has seemed to abandon what it sounded on. And so uh, it's quite good to get out that way, and um, it gives me opportunities to counter the madness in this world. Yes. Well, I'm glad that opportunity has presented itself, and you're taking advantage of it. That's, that's great. Right. Uh, that's so right. The primary purpose that that we've you know we're chatting today, uh, my kind of my hope is that that my audience who hasn't really thought about these things much that we can just kind of have an introduction and and have a few questions that maybe they can be thinking about. But before we get into that, um, you have an an accent compared to an American. So uh, where are you from? Tell me a bit about yourself. What's your uh, what's your life like? Right. Well, I was born. I was born in nineteen forty five. Uh, I'm a war baby. I'm an illegitimate war baby. Uh, my father was a captain in the American army who I was conceived before D-Day, if you like. And um, and I didn't know that till I was 44. So, oh, wow. so uh, he'd, he'd already died. And funny enough, when he died, I was in America, in, 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 uh, in Texas, and the local newspaper uh, featured me with my photograph with the headline the Brits are coming because I was bringing a new technology to the area I was in and um, so it's funny that my father had he opened the paper would have seen my photograph that week he died um, and wow. I was a mile away wow. so that was a hell of a coincidence wow. so um, that's a start of life and then I was born in Liverpool um, which you know of because of the Beatles <laughs> I made my first successful business decision when I was walking down the street in Liverpool and the Beatles were coming the other way on the same side in leather jackets and long hair. And I, and I was with my cousin who was the same age. She was a girl the same age as me. We were about 15, I think. And um, and they were shoving each other and messing about. So we said, let's cross the road. So I cr crossed the road to, to avoid them. And my cousin said, they'll be famous one day, you know. And I said, never, never, ever will they be famous. <laughs> and uh, so that was my first good thing. I should have gone up and said, can I manage you or something? But, um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I've had that. And I've gone from that to, you know, uh, all sorts of things. I've had a very Forrest Gump life, if you like. Uh, I've, I've lived in Saudi Arabia, uh, lived in Africa as a young engineer and those things and so on. I was a, what we call a chartered engineer, and I was in charge of Wales for water resources planning and for all the data collection, sewage, water, you know, hydrology, hydrology, all that sort of thing. 
and um, my job was to plan. That's when I, uh, as part of my job, when I started my career in Cornwall on that, because I was in charge there uh, when I was 25, I got my, became water resource engineer for Cornwall. And um, what I did then was develop mathematical models of climate because we, as engineers, you see, we, we're technology is applying science. And so when we apply science, we have to make it work. It can't just be academic. The bridge can't fall down, right? <laughs> so engineers have to apply science that works. So I had to do climate models that worked, as it were, you know, as best we could, because you have to forecast like how, you know, is this dam going to withstand a one in thousand year flood? Is this reservoir going to be enough for the droughts we can expect so it's that sort of work i was doing then and that's what got me involved in climate way back in the 70s because i'm 78 now and um, that's how i got involved way back okay and so, so that's what i do and then so engineering is uh yeah. what kind of engineer are you well i'm a water resource engineer which okay. is the very much on the modeling and climate and planning so if you want to you know where do we need reservoirs how big do we need them how are they going to moderate the flood how are they going to survive water supply through a drought all that sort of thing plus all the hydrology for a country all that sort of thing okay so that's what i did so i and i had hadn't even realized that you were had as much expertise as you do and i i had kind of assumed that just like a business person if you're good at starting a restaurant and you start five of those you can probably go and start a mechanic shop and understand all of the same can. principles yet you yes. are still in the, your primary field that's wonderful that's wonderful uh, yeah i am in that way in that way i am but i left it i left it in 1980 i went into my own business and i uh, and looking back I was doing an interview on a big on a big podcast, and um, I realized when I was talking that I'm I'm a disruptor. So when I was on a government committee representing Wales, the country, um, they came up with an idea. You know, well, the committee was there for an idea, and how free it's a computer system to do with data collection. And so they said, and this is 1974 five, yes, and they said, um, well, is it feasible? So they employ a consultant for £25,000 then. That, that then was about $50,000, roughly, right? And is it feasible? And and I just couldn't believe all this. So I went away and we wrote it. And we wrote it in 10 weeks. And they came back after about 20 weeks or 15 weeks and said, yeah, it's feasible and it'll cost a quarter of a million dollar, a pounds and it'll take two years. So I then said, when they announced that, I said, okay, it's done. It's finished. We've got it. Yeah. And uh, I did away with the purpose of the whole committee. They had to, I, I sold it. I sold, we sold Wales. So I didn't make money out of it. The company, my, my Quango did, my my government body, Water Resource Wales, if you like, did. And then I got accused of disrupting the accounting system because my department, which was a, a service department to plan and do things, didn't have an income. But I, the number of things I did created the income. So they came and said the accounting system doesn't allow for that. You're, just, you're being very disruptive. And I, I quickly found out that every government body in the world, uh, every non-commercial body where it hasn't got a direct customer it's responsible to, to pay, always organize things to themselves. They don't organize it for the customer. So when I kept, when I was asked by the Anti-Coastal Pollution League that in Wales, they sent me a map and these are the five raw water sewage outlets where we're putting raw water, raw sewage into the sea. Is it true? So I wrote back and said, well, that's true, but there's about another eight. So I added them. And then my director came and said, that was naive. Why you done that? You're giving information away. And my answer was we're public and we haven't got enough money to correct these problems. So you can never correct unless you identify the problem. And I found very quickly, everything is geared to, to us, not to the people we serve. And I couldn't take it. That's why I left. I well, left thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you going an so, honest route. That's a, that's a good that's thing. Right. And then you can more or less forward that. I mean, I was highly disruptive then in my industry. And I was competing with 3M, which is quite a big setup, by the way. And my <laughs> factory, when I went to visit 3M, in Twin City in Minnesota, I think. Um, when I went there, they, they had their own power generation plants. They have their own roads and everything. And I, when I went into reception, their reception, the walk from the front door to the desk, was bigger than my factory. Yes, <laughs> But that's all fact. 
in actual fact, I, I did have a better product in the end. And um, last year, I'm not going to go into it, but last year in America, because we've been, my business was bought out by an American company, and last year it was voted the best product of its type in America. So, wow. I managed to do that. So, and I'm quite proud of that. But I do want to go into the details because it almost subtracts from what I'm doing now. Uh, and what I'm doing now is countering the madness of this world. I've got 10 grandkids, 10 grandchildren. And I, I, I can't believe how what damage is being done to Western Western democracy and Western powers by the madness of this world. And that's what I'm about putting right. And I know I'm only little. I know I can kick, you know, and that's all I can do. But I'm managing to kick bigger and bigger. And I've got I've got an MP, a member of parliament, who um, is actually in the government and he's an MP who runs, he's called the whip and he runs all the MPs and he sits alongside the prime minister in our cabinet, right? So I thought, here's an opportunity. So I expose a scandal and the scandal is this, every single wind and solar farm in the UK claims, oh, we supply 10,000 homes, we supply 20,000 homes. It's a lie because they say according to government figures, but the government figure says, that it's 80% gas, 20% electric. So there, when they say we supply 10,000 homes, they only mean we supply 10,000 homes, providing 80% comes from gas. And by the way, we're trying to do it with the gas. Yeah, well, that's misleading. So I say to my MP in, in an email, look, this is the calculation. There's the power output, not my figure, the wind farm. Yeah, there's the number of houses they claim divide. You only get 20% of the government official average house. And he says, you're a conspiracy theorist. Put me in the videos if you like, you know. So I've now got a cabinet minister. That's like a head of your government, yeah, who will not divide two numbers. So I'm giving a talk in a European Parliament this month. So he's featuring that as the man who can't divide. And I'll be putting it on television as well as the man who can't divide. So and he didn't know what he'd taken on. And um when I started to challenge him and he wouldn't, he doesn't reply to me on this. And the reason is this, if he, his job is to enforce government policy. So if you're an MP and you, and you want to go away, uh, your mother's ill, you've got to come to him and get a ticket to go. You know, they have to manage the votes. They have to whip them, what we call whip. And um, they don't physically whip them, you know, it's called a whip. <laughs> uh, 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 and he had his job, very powerful job. But it, I've got a brick wall in front of me and I want to remove one brick. And it's a very simple brick. The only technology you require is to divide one number. And you know what? He can use his phone. He can put the two numbers in and divide on the phone. I'll accept that. And he won't do it. Now, if he did that, what would be the result? Well, if he did that, it would expose the lie of every single British wind and solar farm. So that would be the brick out the wall. That brick out the wall leaves a hole. And I've got a big crowbar to put in to bring the wall down then. And that's the problem for them. They can't admit the truth. And, and that is a huge problem. And the funny part is the talk I'm giving, and it's in Romania, the talk. Uh, 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 and the, the MPs in Romania invited me. And just, they, again, we just, I don't make any money. They just pay for the air flight. You know, they don't even get paid from a parking at the airport, just the air flight and the hotel. So, uh, 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 and, you know, they invited me, but it's actually part of a COVID conference. And it, it's okay. called, um, it's actually called, got it somewhere here, uh, CIS, it's Canadian International, uh, the COVID International Society of Doctors and Lawyers and all sorts of things who are fighting a lot of madness in the world. And But they've included me as the speaker on climate because climate policy is all about controlling the population. It's not about climate, really. And so I'm invited to give a talk, which is I'm giving a talk on climate, climate alarmism and population control. You know, and I think that, is is it true that the reason that you are so passionate about this area of scientific inquiry is because of the the large scale ramifications? If you think about just the, the average day in a person's life. How oh, enormous. Enormous. Uh, uh, let me tell you, uh, Oxford is a famous place. We have a university there. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to recap this. I'm going to before I answer that, I will answer it. But you had the Salem witch trials, didn't you, in America? Yeah, and most people have heard of them. And it wasn't the people who were going too much. I know they said she's a witch and that, but it was more so it was the Harvard trained. There's a university called Harvard, you know that? <laughs> and they had courses in witchcraft and they you become, you know, you could have a master's or a doctor of witchcraft. And so they're sat as judges 
And every time there was bad weather, they hung people, called them witches, and blamed the bad weather on them or the harvest on them. And you can correlate the cold weather periods with the maximum parts of witchcraft, yes. So outside Oxford now, yes, which is a very old university, uh, I stood and addressed between seven to 10,000 people on what we call a 15-minute city, which I'll now explain. But only two or 3,000 could hear me because the speakers weren't big enough. You know, it blocked the whole of central car, car, um, Oxford. And um, what they were trying to do was imagine your city and imagine a cake where you put slices in. So imagine dividing your city into six slices. But you couldn't go from one slice to the next. If you wanted to go from one slice to the next, you had to travel out to the ring road. So you may only be a quarter mile away from somebody, but you'd have to travel around and go all the way around and come back in. I focused on a grandmother who collected her child from school in another slice. And now she has a three minute journey. And that became a 40 minute journey twice a day to for the family, because, you know, grandkids, I can tell you this, grandparents love grandkids. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and um, so she would collect the child and take her back home because that fitted in with the mother working and she loved doing it. But now she can't. But it's even worse. If you go outside your home with a car, with a car for more than 100 times a year, including work or any reason at all, it's a hundred pound fine per time, right? That is putting people into cages. So it's that, that simple. And and for what? What's all this about? And well, it's all about CO two. Yes. So I, I I I have to campaign on these things. Yes, I have to. And um, so the ramifications for us are a huge. Well, first of all, it's poverty. Now, you you had a period in America where you were fracking. OK, right. And that fracking um, lowered the cost of fuel, the cost of energy incredibly. And we actually were importing it. Now, we've got huge fracking reserves and we won't touch them. And when you examine the engineering aspect, your standard for earthquakes allowable is 3,500 times bigger than ours. Yes. So if you drop, if I pick up this and drop it on the floor here the earthquake caused is all you're allowed for a fracking operation which wow. i don't think the next door neighbor would, hit, would feel and it's it's so there's absurdity so we're talking about poverty we've just had today and i haven't seen the details but i know stop oil today haven't just painted something on the paintings and the art gallery in london that you can wipe off they've attacked it with hammers so now they've ruined and completely destroyed a major piece of art. Now, I was giving a talk in Swindon on the 15-minute city in the public arena in a shopping centre, all legal, and we had a little enclave with tables around, yes? And a Just Stop Oil protester came up and the table was packed with stuff and threw it in the air all over it, yes? And so I wasn't going to let that go. People around me said, let it go. No, I went to the police. The police arrested him there. They were nearby and within 60 seconds, they had him against the wall. So uh, I said, I want to prefer charges. And so did another lady behind me who was a member of the public. And she, we were both the same age, 78. And so everyone else wasn't going to bother. So we went and reported it to the police and we insisted. And the police prosecuted this st Just Stop Oil protester. And he got a 10-month suspended jail sentence, a fine, and, um, uh, and a criminal record. So um, uh, if he does it again within 10 months or anything, he's going to be in trouble. Yeah. Right. My, my granddaughter um, lives near Bristol. So uh, Greta Thunberg was coming to Bristol and all the children were given a half day off. So the education system bows into this madness. And my, my daughter said to my granddaughter, tell me what she's about. And she said, I don't know. So she said, well, you can't go then. <laughs> you don't want to talk <laughs> and, and she didn't go. But um, so Good. that's what's what we're in. We're, we're in a madness where the um, children, and that really is bad to me, children are, are, are being used as fodder. Even Greta Thunberg, in effect, is abused. But people don't realise it was their great grandfather that started the whole CO2 scare. And it was a public relations company that sat her against the wall as a kid of school, etc. Um, but when she was in a congressional hearing in America and she was asked, what's the science behind what you say? Oh, no, no, there is no science. Well, what do you mean by people should panic? Oh, no, I don't mean panic. Yeah. And, and you get this absurdity. So um, I have to fight this, but I fight it with 
call facts and science. So after this, my first live television, I've done television on other subjects before, but after this live television appearance on this subject, I um, sent out a video to give some scientific references and explain because I was given 20 seconds at the end to the to respond to the last question. So I put that out. I invited the other person to put anything on the channel he wants. And um, so that's what I do. I follow up and give you the scientific evidence always. And so what I found is Extinction Rebellion and all these people haven't a clue what they're talking about. They haven't a clue. You can stop them dead in seconds. Yeah. Well, um, so here's a, here's a question. So the person who's watching this video right now, Below the video, look down there, and you're going to see something that says climate change. It's a warning from the United Nations. It's going to say uh, climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns, mainly caused by human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels. So that's the true truth that the government would like you to understand. How close is that? It's below every video of mine. It's below every single video. Yep. And I'm predicting it will be under this one. I, I'm sure they'll catch on oh, really? what we're talking about. Uh, so what what is true and what isn't about that? And is CO2 a greenhouse gra- gas? Is, is this is a greenhouse effect? Is this a problem? Let me give you a lesson. Let me give you a lesson. Um, this may take two minutes or three minutes, right? Uh, there's a first statement. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. CO2 is not just a greenhouse gas. It's quite a good one. It traps heat. Now, people are surprised when I say that. I deal with science, the truth. The molecule of CO2 has has, has got two oxygen and a carbon item, a carbon atom in the middle. So on my videos, I show you this fluxes that way, fluxes this way, it twists and turns in four directions. They're called modes. So when you expose it to a certain frequency of radiation and only a certain frequency, does it do this? Yes. Now, and so what it does is, is it grabs the radiation and heats up, yeah. But And actually the radiation it mainly grabs is not in the short wave, it's in the long wave coming up from, back from the earth. So that's the radiation you feel is heat coming off the, you know, the, the earth, right? Which has been heated up by the sun, of course. So it comes back and it heats. The issue is that number one, it only heats in this little wave band, yes? Which is called the 15 micron. It's between 14 and 16. That's the zone it heats on. There's a big pile of other thing. So it heats up there and there's a limit to it. So it takes up most of it straight away. And then the next bit is it's like painting a wall red. You've got a famous professor from Princeton called um, Professor William Happer. He explains this. Uh, and, And if you paint a barn red and it starts off white or something, it'll be red. Not a great red. It'll be red. If you do another coat, it'll be redder. And after three or four coats, you can't tell how. It doesn't matter how many coats you put on, it's red. And that's exactly the same with CO2. So it has an initial effect. And after that initial effect, hardly any effect. So now if you double CO2, you're not going to get much more than about 0.7 of a degree. And I give the science behind that from William Happer. Um, so, So it isn't that it's not a greenhouse gas, it is. It is more to do with the fact that it used up its it's it shot its bolt. It's had its day early on and it's already had its day. Right. And a tiny, tiny bit more heating could result. Uh, It's insignificant now what could happen. But if it wasn't there, well, first of all, it wasn't there. We wouldn't be here because there'd be no plants and no food and no animals, no higher forms of life at all. Maybe a few microbes below the sea of living off chemistry, you know, but that's all there would be. So it's done its job. And the earth would be a lot cooler if it wasn't there. So it's really important that it's there. It's a, it's the gas of life. It's it's um, you, you're made 18 percent of carbon uh, and they're acting. They, your your EPA can declare it a pollutant. You know, that is total madness, because what pollutant do you shove into a greenhouse to make the plants grow much bigger? Right. So our plants, um, what's happened is with CO2, let's go back 550 million years, 545 million, 50 to the Cambrian period when life started in the oceans. That's where life started. And, and, and when life started in the oceans, the shells were as big as men. Yeah, because the CO2 was not 420 or 415 as it is today. The CO2 was five, six, seven thousand parts per million. Yeah. So there's a lot more CO2, let's say, to put it simply. And life boomed on that. Yes. Boomed on it. Now, what happened then was 
life was soft soft it didn't have shells so some crafty creature decided to try to protect itself so it put a shell around itself to do that it sucked out the carbon yes and it formed and as it died it formed things like limestone coral reefs all that sort of thing so as you go through the 540 million years to today you, you have ice ages and all sorts of things, yes? You have the CO2 level changing a lot, but all the time the CO2 is being buried and buried. Limestone is 40% CO2. Cement is made mainly out of limestone, grinding it out. Ah. So, so, so limestone, uh, 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 coral, uh, 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 marble is, is largely CO2, yes? So these things are animals that have died and formed and taken it away from us. Now, every time an ice age came, you got really cold water. And the atmosphere is as nothing compared to the heat capacity of the oceans. I mean, there's 50 times more CO2 in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere. And and the atmosphere, well, it's insignificant for holding heat compared to all that water. I mean, some of the water currents, and no one disagrees with this, are a thousand years before the same water emerges again on the cycle. Yeah. So, uh, so the... the um, what happened was every time it became an ice age, and that was nothing to do with man, every time there was an ice age, the cold water sucked in CO2. The colder the water is, the more CO2 you have. The warmer the water is, the less CO2. So what happened when you came out the ice age, it started to warm, but it started to warm before the CO2 rose. So the cause and effect wasn't there. You know, it's like saying um, you get more shark attacks uh, it's because of ice cream, because the ice cream sales correlate with shark attacks, which they do, because in the summer they sell more ice cream when people go to the seaside and get bitten by sharks. But that's not cause and effect. So the, here it's not cause and effect. About five to eight hundred years after the temperatures going up, the CO2 comes up because the, the oceans are warmed. So that's what it is. The problem is throughout this 540 million years, less and less CO2 each time, because once it's buried, that's it. It's been taken away from life. So there's no but new CO2 coming into the picture? No, no, it's been, that's right. It's been taken away from life. And what it does is it discards the oxygen, oxygen increased, are you with me? We have good oxygen in the earth, not to worry about it, but the oxygen increased because CO2, take the C out, you've got the O2, you've got the oxygen, yes? Right. So it buried, it buried CO2 over time. And that burying your CO2 over time meant that we got down to the last, the last ice age to 180 parts per million. And death occurs to planet Earth at 150. Okay. So we are that close to extinction. Have we carried on now for 2 million years, life on Earth would cease to exist because we'd, have, we'd be below the 150. Yeah? Interesting. So, 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 so CO2... We're in a CO2 drought. In each piece of vegetation, there are tiny holes called stomata. That you can't see them; they're really tiny. And those stomatas breathe CO2. That's what breathe. And what's happening now is, as we increase CO2, and it's not caused by man, by the way. The main CO2 increase is caused by we're coming out of the little ice age, so we're warming the waters gradually. And the warming started 150 years before 1850. It started actually in 1690. That was the deepest part. We started warming by itself, by itself, without man doing the, without Britain destroying the world by giving everyone a fantastic lifestyle with the Industrial Revolution. You know, we are to blame. We are to blame. That's what politicians today say. We're to blame. We gave the world all this. We gave the world all this quality of life. We gave the world this. We gave the world that. We're terrible people. Yes. So, uh, and so the, as you, as you come out, um, we're, we're, we've got this problem. And I see a future where we're grinding up limestone just to make CO2. And, uh, and if you put CO2 into a greenhouse, which people do, they have to pay for that. Um, the plants are enormous. If you double the CO2, the difference in the growth is like this. It's enormous. And we're now having in the world record crops. We've got record cereal yields. We've got record rice yields. We've got record, uh, uh, we, um, see, the wheat, uh, not wheat, the other one. There are two types of plant now. Now, when when you reduce the CO2, these tomato, these holes have to be bigger. And these holes have to lose more moisture. I'm opening up and I'm letting the moisture out because I want the CO2. Yes. 
Now, that means that you need more water as it reduces. So as we increase it, they need less water. And that's why the Sahara Desert's being encroached on by plant life now, because the plant life with more CO2 needs less water. Okay. Yes? So, so when you start to put this like that, you begin to understand. So CO2 is great. We need more of it. We need more of the very thing they're trying to destroy, right? And in doing that, and they know it, they know it because if you plot all the, um, uh, I can give you a graph to put on here, okay? But if right. you plot all the all the um, COP conferences and all the climate conferences on the CO2 curve, which everyone agrees on the CO2 curve, we're actually increasing it all the time. This fact would be humorous if it was not so sad and costly. This is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's continually growing. And no matter what conferences you have, Kyoto, Paris, Copenhagen, they make no difference at all. Because the countries that produce most CO2 by far are not controlled by them. For all the hot air you hear in the UK about zero targets, it is all meaningless. We have not achieved any saving in CO2 in any event. All we've managed to do is export our manufacturing abroad where there are lower pollution standards, so we've increased pollution, and actually increased the amount of CO2. This is why this curve shows you that no matter what conference you have, no matter what you do, the CO2 is going to rise anyway. It's an essential part of life. And you know, that is good news. So in the last 20 years, uh, uh, fossil fuel output has increased threefold compared to compared to renewables. And renewables in the world are at a couple of percent, that's all, and causing destruction. And if we were serious, because in other words, anything America does, if America sank below the waves tomorrow, it wouldn't really change the growth of CO2. It would carry on growing. If Wales, where I live, disappeared below the oceans tomorrow, it would only take a day or two, <laughs> and, and the effect would have been lost. So if they were serious about reducing CO2, they wouldn't be doing... They wouldn't be doing these things. They'd be doing other things. They'd be campaigning outside the Chinese embassy and saying, you've got to stop. But they're not. They're not. It's a political left-wing thing. It really is. And no one can defend it. So no one can defend it. So I do videos like, let's take a wind farm. When the wind stopped, it stopped to less than 1% for nine days in 2018 in Britain. And so we got no wind at all. That's not unusual, by the way, and that's not the worst case, but it's a very simple case to explain because I can take nine continuous days. The shortage in our power was 7,200 gigawatt hours. 7,200 gigawatt hours. Uh, I was the water resource engineer for our biggest pump storage scheme in Europe. It's called in Norwich in North Wales. It supplies 9.1. So we're looking for 7,200 of these things. We've got 9.1. They're planning a multi-billion one at... 30. So, okay, let's call it 39. Well, let's round it to 40. We need 7,200. Batteries and all those things are not viable. They, we'd have to do more than the twice the GDP at today's prices to make up that shortfall in that one nine day. Twice the GDP, three and a half trillion we'd have to spend in pounds. That's about $5 trillion. And But it's worse because if we put that demand onto the world for minerals for that, the price would go not three and a half trillion. It would be 10 trillion to 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 electrify all the cars not the vans not the trucks in britain in some materials would use 70 percent of the world supply to put that demand on from a little country like britain would cause the prices to rocket like unbelievably it's not viable it's not viable so there's no part of all this that makes any sense at all other than trying to control people that's all it's about it's trying to control people. And, and there's a terrible disease in the West where we blame ourselves for all sorts of things, all sorts of things um, that we're, we're not guilty of. Uh, and America has got something we haven't got. We're losing freedom of speech in Britain. We're losing it. Um, and uh, we have lost a lot of it already. And it's a pity because we started it. But what you've got, we haven't got a written constitution. You have. And that written constitution has protected you a lot, a lot from all sorts of things. Um, but there's real danger coming your way, because if you want to know how bad it can get, oh, we're just ahead of you. We're ahead of you in the badness. Our offshore wind farm industry now has turned around to the government. The government do auctions and say, well, you want this offshore wind in that area? Bid for it. No one bid. 
No one bid for offshore wind. So the offshore wind industry has come back. They did a video recently. It got 40 to 43,000 views in Britain. And, and, and they said, we want 70% more price, please. 70%. Hold on. It's meant to be cheaper. No, no, it isn't. Um, the offshore, I'll give you another example. When the wind stops, and the only thing that can make it up is gas. You see, nuclear is great for stable, but it doesn't react quick. So you need the stable things, uh, like coal can do stable. I can't do fast. But the only thing really that does fast is gas. And, when, and you've got two types of gas turbines to make the power. One is open circuit, one is closed circuit. The open circuit is fast. It can react fast. The closed circuit's not as fast. So we're having to favor building open circuit. The problem is the open circuit emits 50%, 30 to 50% more CO2, um, more fuel. So in other words, they've imposed huge extra costs on everyone else. In Britain, uh, the committee of MPs looked at Scottish wind farms and a set of three Scottish wind farms, 50% of the time we paid them to turn off. Why? Because we don't control the wind overnight when our demand is low and we've got to keep the grid in balance. So we've actually paid Belgium to take, we said, oh, we got all our extra power. Belgium to want some. No, we don't. We've got the same problem. Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll pay you twice as much. No, that's not good enough. We'll pay you five times the price of electricity. No, no, 10 times we had to pay before they took it. Yes. So uh, a, a child could make up a better thing than this. A child could. Yes. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Wow. That's what we're doing. And that, I'm only exposed to a few tiny things of the stupid things. But no one will debate me. My problem is the first debate I've ever had was on television for seven minutes. Yeah. And actually, what, what he, when you watch the video, it's quite funny because his argument wasn't science against me. His argument was, uh, do you respect David Attenborough? Well, yeah, in the sense I used to respect him. Well, he, he, he you know, he, he's made a movie on Netflix uh, and so on. And I said, I lost respect for David Attenborough when he did the walrus story. I don't know if they realize it, but it came on. First of all, the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef, which he goes, it's dying, it's dying, is the healthiest it's ever been in history. Who says that? A 35-year 35 35-year 35 study by a group of scientists commissioned to do it. Who says that? Peter Ridd, the professor in Cook University, Australia, who got sacked for saying it. Yes, because now you don't have science. So I don't know of any climate scientists because to be a scientist, you've got to be open to skepticism. Yes, you've got to be open to it. So to be a scientist, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a now a new telescope in space. I think it's called the J telescope. Yeah. Now, before that went up, everyone was happy. They'd worked it out. Galaxies form at a certain time from the Big Bang, blah, blah, bang. Yeah, all worked out. The problem was it showed you the galaxies too big and too early. Hold on. There's something really wrong here. Basically, the Big Bang, it was now questioning. How, it's not possible. All your theories are wrong. And not only that, you've all agreed on them. They're wrong, right? And so the last week they went to a professor in Durham who's got the biggest computer in the world for this cosmology. And, and they said to him, are you worried now? And, you know, it's terrible. And he said, no, I'm happy. And they said, but you're wrong. He said, but that makes it exciting for us. And I can tell you another form. I tell you one thing I've learned in my 78 years. Any government body will organize itself for itself, not for you. Right, that's one. The further you get away from politics, like cosmology, the truer the science. They're my two golden rules I, I operate on. Believe me, they work. So, so, uh, and then people say to me, well, who are you? And he did this on the program. I did this on my broadcast on Saturday, you know, sort of thing. Um, and it's called an appeal to authority. Yes, mm -hmm. don't do that in science. So today we've got the whole cosmology in disarray, which is great. Yeah, but you don't have that in climate science. They won't allow me to debate. I challenge them. And when they watch my videos, they don't want to debate me, right? So I take any, I know this podcast is quite a small one, but I'm spending the time because I'm passionate about the subject and I'm willing to debate anybody. You know, arrange a debate, I'll come on, arrange a debate with somebody, I'll come on. On the train to London the other day, and it's quite a long journey for me, it's five hours. Um, I was on, alongside an environmentalist who'd done a, uh, done a master's and he'd done a wind farm for his thesis in the Bristol Channel. And he didn't know about the trick. There's a trick, you know, the 20 percent trick where they don't supply all that. And, I, and he didn't know. And I said, well, how do you allow for the bird kills? In Germany, 200,000 bats a year are killed by wind farms. 
The bat, poor bat doesn't have to get near because the change in pressure, the wind ring, it travels 150 miles an hour or so. And the change in pressure causes the, a, a little vacuum which explodes their lungs. Yeah, it, 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 they, they actually are destroying 3,500 tons of insects every year. But they're now ripping down a wind farm to make a coal mine. Yes, to, because the coal underneath. So, they need energy. <laughs> That's right. So, so not all of this is crap. And the whole problem is, Hitler, who wasn't a particularly nice man, right? Don't like Hitler at all. He used the children. He educated children, the Hitler Youth, etc. He brainwashed people after ruthless extermination of opposition. He brainwashed people. That's what's gone on in this. They brainwashed the children. I have to counter it to my grandchildren. So they brainwashed the children. So when I was on the train with this bloke, who was in his maybe 22, 23, he's had the whole of his life brainwashing of this, right? It's not true. And you've had, there's so many examples, the surgeon, the, the doctor who came up with the truth of what caused ulcers in your stomach, he was laughed at, yes? The head of our, 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 our journal on, on, um, on medicine, the respected journal, said 50% of the papers they print are wrong. That's how science works. Without the challenge, you haven't got science. So without that scientific process, and unless your work, unless your work extends to, um, to, to allowing that scepticism, you haven't got it. What we've got today is, and I want you to push this on, I'll give you the chart. So I'm going to explain it now, assuming you push the chart on. Here you've got a whole temperatures. These are the temperatures of the climate bubbles. These are the real temperatures measured by satellite and balloons and balloons. So all of these are wrong because they don't agree with reality. And if uh, if your experiment doesn't agree with reality, scrap it. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are. It doesn't matter how many names you've got after yourself, how, you know, what qualifications you got. Wrong. So there we are. So now we've got 102 models that are wrong. So what we do is in a society, we put these in a room and we say, before you go in the room, we know they're wrong. And you get in the room and you say, well, let's work out a balance. Let's work out a consensus. And so they take an average of these 102 wrong ones. They come out and say, right, the whole of Western economies are now going to be trashed on this consensus. Climate models are not science. They're opinions. They're opinions. They're not evidence. Evidence is always has to be checked against reality. So now I'll come on to one of my videos. That's worth watching. It's how I became a skeptic. And it's, and, and it's coming back to the cold because we're heading for cold times now, between now and 2035. And I'm going to explain it this way. My first work looked at the cycles in the data. And in doing that, I discovered in river flows, which are purely rain-fed rivers, no springs. I discovered because instead of having a little tin to collect water in to measure the rain, I've got a whole catchment then, right? So I take the monthly flows for over 100 years and I find the sunspot cycle in them. 11 year sunspot cycle so that was in 1971 right so i know that the rain even today you can look at rainfall records in most places if they do the monthly rainfall records yeah or the yearly ones sorry the yearly ones you'll see about 10 or 11 year cycle in them right yes. so i analyze so the recent analysis explains everything by cycles and explains in the cycles the enzo which is the you've heard of uh, la lina and el nino Mm -hmm. And the climate alarmists say, oh, it doesn't matter because they're internal and the cold balances out the warm. So it makes no difference to the climate overall. Wrong. They come in clusters, the decadal clusters. And so if you take the decadal clusters uh, 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 and allow for that, and then you take them away. I now I produced a graph um, on my last video just done today where you take them away. You've accounted for every change in weather since 1959. There's no nothing left, right? So, and just on that, but in actual fact, that links to something else, the cycles. Now, I'm going to explain the cycles to you. Imagine you've got a long-term record going back a couple of thousand years, which you can get by using proper sites. But imagine you're a very, you're a man capable of living those thousands of years and you're sitting in a chair. And this is the way I try to explain it. So this old man who's capable of living a thousand years Starts off his life, uh, let's say we'll take him from 10. Yeah. So he's sitting there as a 10 year old and someone kicks him in the shin. Yeah. And they kick him in the shin every 10 minutes. Yeah. And this carries on year in, year out. And then someone else at the same time is hitting them in the back of the head. But they hit him in the back of the head every hour. And someone else is hitting them, hitting, hitting him in the stomach every year. Yeah. 
After a while, this man gets used to the fact what's coming. So if you said to him, what's coming in the next 10 minutes? You know, you say, I'm going to be hit, right? If you say, what's coming in the next hour? I'm going to be hit. What's coming in the next year? That's like climate. So, and that's why we're able to predict what's coming, right? Because it's very clearly explained by doing just Fourier series analysis, which is what, won't get technical, but just that. Very simple, mathematical, really. Uh, uh, and so that's what's happening. But it's all ignored. Now, why did the IPCC, which is not a scientific body, the IPCC is a government body. And the people who write the journal, uh, they're called the Summary for Policymakers, which go to all the governments, are not scientists. So they often disagree with their own scientists because it's purely political. And there's 185, 190 of them, and most of them are third world countries. So then you've got situations like the Maldives, because we're going to go underwater, hold a, a cabinet meeting, a meeting for government under the water in suits as a publicity thing. Yeah. But they've grown in size. And for every single island has grown in the Pacific and Indian Ocean by 8% on average, by the way. So mm -hmm. Vanuatu, which I almost sailed to, actually, I sailed around Pacific Islands, but Vanuatu um, uh, has grown 2.8%. This year, the Vanuatu was sitting on the on about a foot of water on a chair, the prime minister asking for help with money to help the problem. So it's, it's ridiculous. People are asking for money for a problem that doesn't exist. The head of the uh, IPCC meeting, the part that looked at uh, river, sorry, uh, sea, sea rise, uh, a Swedish uh, professor gave in, he resigned. He said, well, there's no problem. So if you don't accept the CO2 narrative, which I don't, the IPCC, who are only charged with man-made climate, they're not charged with looking at natural. There's no jobs for them. So now yeah. you've got an organization where there's no gravy train. So if they accept the truth, there's no gravy train left anymore. Yes? And that is, that is important, right? Interesting. So, sorry, I've, I've gone on and tried to connect a few things there, but it goes to much more depth than we're going to now. And I've got almost 90 videos on in my YouTube channel, uh, and it goes through all different aspects, all sorts of different aspects, um, the technology, the green energy. I mean, it's this bad that I was asked to help to resist a solar farm um, uh, uh, in South Wales. And it was a beautiful little valley, and they were going to plaster it with solar panels. So I was asked to help. So they said, well, there's a public meeting. The experts are there, you know, to question. So all, you know, the people come. And I said, I go up to, uh, to the first one, and I say, how much energy do you produce? And that's a pretty simple question for someone, yeah? yeah. And he said, he said 20 megawatts. And I said, no, that's a speed, if you like. The energy there is how fast it's flowing. 20 megawatt hours. When you buy a kilowatt home, you don't buy a kilowatt, you buy a kilowatt hour, yeah? So, and he said, no, it's 20. So I said, do you know the difference? No. I said, he said, look, you better speak to my boss. So I went to the boss, I asked him the same question. How many? 20. So we went through that. And I said, and he said, oh, you'll have to write in then. How many homes do you supply? 5,300. According to what? Average home. That's when I found out, by the way, that they were leaving the average home to be supplied with 80% gas. Because the government average home uses 80% gas, 20% electric. They're only supplying the electric bit. You with me? So when they say supply 10,000 homes, everyone thinks, oh, well, they power 10,000. No, no, no. They only right. power 2,000 homes. It's not even that in reality, but I'll, I can go into that. So that's how bad it is. That's how bad it is. Um, I've got this MP who's a cabinet minister who won't accept simple division. That's how bad it is. So I feel as if the world's gone insane around me. That's how I am. I will now shut up for more questions. No, I, I'm loving le learning from you. Thank you so much. So I'm trying to piece first, things together for you. So years ago, when I first started hearing about, uh, well, global warming was the first thing. And I, I've always been resistant. And, and I've, I've just thought it doesn't sound right. I don't have a, a engineering mind. I'm not that bright. But I just I thought, you know, there's some things that kind of make sense and some things don't. And, and it just the gut test, it doesn't pass it. Right. And then it, things change to climate change some years later. So when it, the reason it, because it stopped warming, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have to have a By the way, climate thing. changes too. There's always climate change, but carry on. Yeah. And so it seems to me that some of the basics, some of the basic lies or, or concerns. So did uh, for years, I argued, I don't think that this big old earth here is going to be influenced by something that man did for 75 years. Was I wrong? Was it the industrial revolution? Was it last hundred years that caused whether no, it's good or bad? 
The Industrial Revolution started in the UK first in 1850. That's the start of it. And by the way, even at its full blast, the UK was outputting very small amount. It wasn't until the world got going. But uh, uh, it was already warming for 150 years before that, as I've explained. So, so first of all, the CO2 was already rising and it was already warming. Right. Um, so that's it. Now, as it, uh, what they're arguing, we're coming out of the depth of the Little Ice Age in 1690. Yes. Now, that little ice age where the Thames froze over, and by the way, lots of your rivers froze over the lot. You know, it wasn't just London or anything. It was right across the world. And I've got a video on that. It happened in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Right. So we have this really cold time. So what are they wanting? Are they wanting us to stay in that? Just apply some logic straight away. They're saying they want to, let's say they were right. They want us to stay in this terrible time when the crop yields were terrible, couldn't feed the world. When there was famines everywhere, the worst the worst um, drought in Britain was in 1757. Um, the worst hurricanes were at the turn of the century in the late 1800s in America. The biggest disasters were around then. No, no, they want us to stay in that. So what they have to do, and are related to America now, there was a thing called the Dust Bowl in America, which I think most Americans might know about, and wraps of um, Grapes of Wrath and all that. Yes, the book, Steinberg or someone. So... Um, they've denied that. No, they, they changed the temperatures. They changed the temperatures from the 1930s. It warmed from the Little Ice Age to the 1930s. Then it reduced to the 1970s. And by the end, by, and during the 1970s, everyone, the Ice Age is coming. You're going to get a new Ice Age. You know, they wrote to President Nixon, you know, we've got to put, we've got to put charcoal, we've got to put coal dust over the, to stop, the, we've got to absorb heat in the Arctic, we've got to coat the ice to, and all this, scare. I've done a whole video on that, and I repeated the scare, by the way, because they tried to deny it later. So, uh, 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 and so they come up with this idea that, that, that this ice age, and then in the 80s, it started to warm. And then James Hansen started, <laughs> incredible, James Hansen had a Congress meeting um, where he was going to try and explain that his model was showing CO2 and all this, yes? Because Greta Thunberg's ancestor had started this scare, yeah? Let's resurrect this scare. And so we had the Congress meeting, but it was going to be in a place that was quite hot and they depended on air conditioning. So him and his mate, and by the way, they admit this, this I'm not too, they go into the meeting hall beforehand and sabotage the air conditioning. So when they're having the meeting, everyone's sweating like hell, they're saying it's getting hotter and hotter, and they got money. Yeah, that's a good way to start the fraud, isn't it? Right? So that's your James Hansen. And so, uh, and then round about... Um, the big problem became in Dr. Mann. He wasn't a doctor at the time. He, he was a postgraduate student. And he did the hockey stick, what we call the hockey stick. And, and that's where everything's level. Everything's going fine. It's actually cooling and cooling. Everything's going fine. But it's not very much. And suddenly it's like this, the hockey stick, because of man. Right. The most incompetent piece of science you could ever imagine. That was 19, so 1998. The USA official NOAA records were... Increase to the 1930s, come down to the 1970s, go up again. Yes, the official. Two years later, after the 1999 hockey stick, it was increased a bit there, level out a bit there, trying to hide the 1970s, 40s cooling, and then up, up and up, right? Rubbish. They changed the data, and it's called homogenization. Yes? And when you start to look, as I do, into everything, and you don't just look at the pure science, you look at practical things, science has to agree with history. If you look at 1066, if you look at a uh, medieval warm period, we had castles on the seashore. They're now, they're now two miles inside the seashore. Yes. And they used to chuck the traitors out the traitor's window straight into the sea. Get rid of them, don't bother hanging them, chuck them into the sea. Yeah, that's now, all you do is go into a bit of soggy peat. Yes. Uh, if you look at um, history or, or, or in the Middle Evil Moon period for um, uh, uh, Greenland, they were farming it. They're not now. They can't. If right. you look at your lot, if you go over to America and you look in Canada, where was the tree line then? And there's a Black Bruce tree, Black Bruce tree line 80 miles north of where it is today. So we know for certain. And that was there for 1,500 years, by the way, that that, that forest. Uh, and it didn't recover because it got had a natural... If you look at forestry in the UK, forest fires, right? They were fantastically high in the past and are very low now. 
They're five times higher in the past. Your president deleted the data. But of course, the records are that deleted data. So what I do in my videos, you'll see it if you go and watch your videos. I say, look at this scare when it's rising. And the forest wears rising because of really bad management. Yes, because they were leaving the ground. They were leaving the ground natural things that build up to form the public ground. They were leaving it there. And so it was increasing through bad bug management. But if you then take it back, as I do on the graph, and you've got a great guy called called, called um, Tony... Um, I've got his name now again, Tony. He does a website with all this history on. So I use his technique, take it back, and it's up here. So you've got a graph like that, forest fires, and down here now. Yeah, but you've got that with everything. So Biden didn't like that, even though the official forestry records. And so he deleted them when he came into power. I that saw is- that on one of your videos. And speaking of your videos, your your series of seven videos yeah. um that is just the per and i'm gonna have a link to those and of course to your main yeah. site that yeah. that just opened my eyes to so many things that i yeah. didn't oh well, they're my first videos i've learned a lot since then as well because you're constantly learning you know what i'm trying to do now uh, i'm trying to when i say to you a kick in the stomach and it comes every 10 minutes then if you you know and after you've just had the 10 minute kick in the stomach if someone asks you when are you going to get the next kick you'd say oh probably in 10 minutes right because right. i've had it for the last two thousand years um i'm trying to explain it to everybody and kids children and the biggest compliment i ever had was on the first of those videos that a child came home from school a mother phoned me and told me an 11 year old came home and said i watched it mother said watch this and they said i'm not taught that at school yeah and and so um that's sad for me and there's other things going on in other areas. I mean, now, even the science of biology is being vandalized today. Uh, 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 and so anything that's anywhere near politics vandalize the science. So I'm sorry, I have no respect and I don't call any climate scientist a scientist when they refuse to debate. Now, what happened is they used the term from the Holocaust, Holocaust denier. And there's no doubt there was a Holocaust. Uh, 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 and uh, they use that term climate denier right and then they say we're not going to discuss it with you are they so weak they can't discuss it with someone like me right yeah. uh, are they so weak that that, that 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 that's the case so my job is to open eyes of everyone and it started to accelerate i used to get like four or five thousand views on a video and the last major one i did was forty three thousand and uh, now I'm on live television as well, so a uh, national television. So um, while I'm getting more hate stuff, yeah, I can't help that. But um, how can I have hate stuff for climate? I mean, who am I offending here? I'm talking science, you know. Right. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's how silly this world is. I dropped but an you... apple and it fell down, and then people are, wait, that's just an experiment. Why are you angry at me for telling you that an apple dropped? When I <laughs> that's right. Out? It's... But don't forget, uh, uh, I, need, I, know, I know there's schools of thought about evolution, but I, I mean, Darwin, poor old Darwin, came under terrible attacks for publishing his theory of, his theory of evolution uh, and so on. So, um, and of course, when DNA came along, when we discovered DNA and everything, it tallied with the whole thing of the life lifestyle thing for the whole history of creatures, if you like. So um, I'm not there to offend anyone's beliefs. But but I I can't respect beliefs that are not founded in evidence. I, I I'm a scientist, uh, and so I can't I, I can't do that. And um, uh, so I've come across a lot of experiences. I've travelled around the world. I've travelled around many states. I've probably been. Someone said to me, I've been to about thirty of the states, I suppose, or thirty five of them. And someone said, you've probably been to more states than most Americans. You know, yeah. but I'm happy to be wrong. So I'm happy for another for a person claiming to be a climate scientist to come on and then defeat me on something. And I'll just turn around and say I'm wrong. And it wouldn't worry me because I'd rather be taken out of my ignorant world and put in the right world than I would stay in that ignorant world. Yes. I, it's, not, it's not to do my arguments are not to do with Paul Burgess. They're to do with a, a thing outside me called the truth. And And so if that truth is shown to be false in any part, I can take the new part in and plug that in. And I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not apologizing for being wrong. I'm, I'm, I don't apologize for searching for the truth. So I don't expect anyone to believe anything I say. But let let them watch the videos and then let them question themselves. And now here's another thing. So far, I'm getting hard at this. So far, I've responded to every question in the comments under every video by everyone. 
that's unusual yes. uh, uh, because there was nothing to hide you know nothing to hide i can tell you now that that um tony heller is that site i was thinking of tony heller site uh, he's on youtube and he's got his own website he is brilliant at looking back in history so he will say look look let's look back to let's look back to the time when they changed the temperature from hot to cold historically what happened that year oh 40,000 people died in paris of heat in this cold spell yes and he goes into american history european history world history and showing you the events and how they cheated and changed the temperature interesting uh, and so i really would recommend tony heller for the more technical uh because i've just done a response to my live appearance so I could give the references afterwards and everything on YouTube. That's my latest video. Came out last night or this morning. And I, I gave all the references. Uh, and that um, is always what I try to do. You know, I, I always try to do that. But that men mentions Tom Nelson. And Tom Nelson has a site on YouTube with about 130 guests like me so far. And a lot of them are chemists, engineers, climate scientists, professors, everything. Yeah. And they go into detail on their particular narrow thing. So, but they're all skeptics, by the way. But they all go into detail on on that, you know, the effect of the grouping of the of, of La Ninas and El Ninos. Uh, uh, and so on. Uh, it's, I always get that, La Nina and El Nino. And so um, they, they'll go into that. So I really recommend that. But those are the people who want to spend an hour looking at one little part. Mm -hmm. So my job, my task, is not to replace them. In fact, I, I feature those things on my videos, not to replace them because they serve a vital function. My job is to make it simple to understand everything. My job is to bring you that message that takes an hour and five or 10 minutes. Yeah, yes. that's my uh, Thank and, and you I, for that. <laughs> I've, made, I've made documentary videos. So I travel the world, just two of us, myself and my wife, and she's only four foot ten, so I only count her as half a crew. So it's one and a half of us traveling the world. I'm, I'm only joking. Of course. <laughs> and, and she's the best, best first mate you could ever have as regards sailing, it really is. And we set off to sail around the world, having never sailed before, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we make documentaries on that. And, um, and I, I, you know, we make a documentary about Myanmar, which I'm trying to sell to television channels and things. So we do that. Uh, um, but in doing that, I retraced the steps of Darwin to some extent. And what we found is, and we visited the most remote island in the world, the BBC called it the most remote, population of 45 people at the time we arrived. And the island's divided into three, a British man settled with three Polynesian wives. So the old volcano, the Atoll Ring, each part is divided into three. And uh, they know there's no mark there, but everyone knows to within an inch where it is. Uh, uh, we, you know, we, but they had... Where you've got people, you don't have. Where you haven't got people, you've got fantastic coral. It's as simple as that. And um, so we were able to examine lots of things for ourselves. And of course, it was Darwin who pointed out in his books, in his work, that islands grow in time, not not reduce, which is why there aren't any sinking islands. You know, remember all the scares about sinking islands? None. Let's take polar bears. I, I came across... Polar bears have grown four times population since the 1970s. Do you know what really helped in that? Was we stopped shooting them as much in the 1970s. Uh, Russia and, and, and America and Canada all agreed no more shooting, only except for some by the natives and that sort of thing. Right? So uh, that's why. Uh, uh, and so I came across a television thing in America. The uh, most stupid piece of television I've ever seen. I used it. I grabbed it and used it on the video. And it's this bloke. Oh, we arrived down, we arrived up in Alaska to, um, oh, we arrived up at this place, Bering Island or somewhere. We arrived up there to study the marvellous wildlife. And we saw lots of healthy polar bears, not so healthy there, you know, really great thriving place. Great. But then we turned a corner and there was this starving polar bear going into rubbish bins, right? And then it is starving. And they, this went round the world. Yes, this is climate change. Yeah. So my job then was to publish this as it was and to say, there's all these healthy bears, but climate change has picked on this one around the corner. <laughs> right? Just this one. It's picked on this one and it's lost its teeth because of its age and, and it's going to die. And I'm sorry, a really nasty, slow death. Yeah. I can't help that. Yeah. But it's not to do with climate change. So but at the end of that, a lot of people will not connect it, even though it's obvious. It's so obvious. It's laughable. 
people won't connect it. So my job is to connect the dots and say, think about that. Really think about it. Uh, my boat was in New Zealand. We were in New Zealand, right in the capital there, and um, in an arena, and we we're touring New Zealand. And when I went back on the boat, the new, the fires came in Australia, the big fires, forest fires. And actually, the, the, the result of that was being deposited on our boat in Auckland. And um, but their fire chief came on and said, you allowed the base load, the ground load, to build up. Now, the Aboriginal used to burn through, and they burned the ground load through to get rid of it, at a stage when it wouldn't burn the trunk. Okay. So it would pass by, right? It would pass by. A certain species in America need the fire to germinate the seed to start the process. Okay. But but so it did but no no. The Australians now weren't allowed to go and collect this wood for fires. No, no, we've got to preserve it. So the wokeness goes into all branches of science that destroys the science. So Sorry, you're not scientists, climate people. You're not. If you believe in this alarmism, you're not scientists. And we need more CO2. So I did a video called More CO2, Please. And I started off with Oliver Twist. And Oliver Twist walks up with all the kids there in the, in the orphanage. And he says, can I have more, please? And he's, but more? How dare you ask for more? That's where I stopped the video. And it, it wasn't porridge, it was gruel. My, my wife said, you've made a mistake, it's gruel they had, not porridge. You know, it was worse than porridge. And um, so that, and then I go into why we want more CO2. So I, I explained it, but I then use science to, to explain why we need, we're better off with more CO2. So that's what I'm about. If, when I'm standing up in this parliament in about 10 days, um, my first message is more CO2, that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. CO2 does vibrate and hold the energy, but it only holds it. And actually, what it uses all the energy it's got in that bandwidth. So the only way it can add is more, more sun power. It can't add by itself. And it isn't, people use the term saturation. It's called CO2 saturation. I think it's a bad word because it's there ready, but it can't take any more because there isn't any more. It's at all the porridge coming from the sun. Yes. And, and, and so the only way you get more heat on Earth is to have higher sun power. And the other thing is, some fantastic work has been done. Um, it is the sun, by the way, that controls us with everything. But I, I'll tell you this about uh, about how exploding nova stars exploding change the weather on Earth in patterns. And the work is based on this: when the sun is shining, it, it goes on a cycle. Yes, the eleven year is actually only part of a twenty two year cycle, and there's other bigger cycles. But when the sun is on the cycle, when we know the 11 year cycle, it goes from a maximum pushing out to a minimum pushing out. So the alarmists say, but the difference is quite small. It can't change. It's only one and a half watts a square meter. It can't have any effect of any seriousness. Wrong. When the sun is strong, when the sun is weak, I'll do it for this way around, the cosmic rays coming in, the protons coming in from old supernova exploding. Yes. Now we pass through arms in the galaxy of this. And ice ages happen when we pass through the arms. Why? Why does this cosmology affect weather? Because when the sun is powerful, it stops the cosmic rays. So when the sun is when the sun is powerful, it stops it, and you get clear skies and you get warmer times. When the sun is weak and the cosmic rays come in, they seed clouds. Hmm. Right? And when they seed the clouds, you get a lot of cloud coverage. And the cloud coverage causes coldness because it reflects the sun back. Yes, it stops. So believe it or not, dying... And when you date through this scientific work, it checks out completely for the whole of history. It checks out. So in actual fact, it's that that's controlling your Enzos and your Laninas and so on. And and so I, I'd love to do a video, and this is what I'm going to be work on for next year, my own original work of linking everything together in one big thing. Uh, and it's going to be hey. all back to the sun. Yeah. So I told you bits of the whole story, like a bits of a jigsaw without putting the whole jigsaw in. But I've done my best in a limited time. I mean, I've got no limited amount of time for this, but I've done my best to to give you a, an idea of what the jigsaw looks like. Yes. Right? The jigsaw. And there's not one person on this normal person on this earth that's not capable of understanding it. If a scientist is able to, no matter how clever they are, no matter how good they look and all that, if they can't explain to non-scientific people what it's about, they don't know the subject. They're hiding behind a wall. Then you can't do that. Don't allow them to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there, there we are. So now, speaking of sailing, this is a big thing in um, in our 
community as a, a voluntarism. There's a conference yeah. that many of our uh, people who enjoy this channel uh, would go to each year in Acapulco. And so we all have this great love for Acapulco because we would meet there. It's the only time I've been sailing. We went out there for a, a lesson, yeah. my wife and I. Uh, so I kind of yeah. tied that in. Um, what just happened in Acapulco, that brings up the the topic that I loved listening to your videos about, uh, about these extreme weather events and is Acapulco and this sudden change from a slight weather system to a class five hurricane, isn't that conclusive proof that uh, there's a climate change? And what's the span? What's the difference? How many years does it take for weather to become uh, climate? Well, there's always climate. So all climate is, is weather over a very long time. So if you're talking about Arctic ice, they've taken the peak of the Arctic ice extent for um, about 150 years, actually, right? 200 years, maybe. So that, that they start at a very high level. And then they show you it coming down. It's labeled out now, but they show you that coming down. They panic you. So on the video, I'm using the Tony Heller work. I just take it past before 1979, and the 50s were much lower than it is now. Yes? So if you're going to look at that, you've got to look at the whole cycle. So if you've got a cycle like that, and you take the downward part if you're trying to scare people, or you take the upward part of its temperature and you're trying to scare people. Yeah, that's what they do. So you've got to look. All climate is is a pattern of weather as a pattern. That's what it is. But that pattern varies according to the subject. You've mentioned the hurricane, so I'll give you the advice. I'm now going to put up um, a hurricane chart, roughly the last hundred and odd years. Yes, look, it's reducing. So if anything, hurricanes are reducing. Right. And you can measure hurricanes in different ways. This one I've just shown you is the landfalls in America. Yeah. So that's the opposite of what you're being taught, by the way. Another way of looking at hurricanes would be to measure the amount in each hurricane. So it's it's a total energy transferred from the equator up to the poles. So the hurricanes are natural. They're there doing a job. Oh, I've got this difference in heat. Before you go anywhere, remember this. Weather is all about differences. If you haven't got a difference, you don't have weather, right? So you've got cold and, and hot equator. As you as it spins up north, it's distributing the heat to the further north. That's its job. So if you warm, if you warm the poles and all the warming, even in the models, is always from the poles. The cooling and the warming is always from the poles. If you warm the poles, the difference is less. You have less heat to transfer. You have less difference. So that's why hurricanes are reduced. And you can measure it in different ways. But no matter how you measure it, there's a slight reduction in hurricanes. That's number one. Right. So anything you look at when you look at the data doesn't tally with what you're being told. Right. It's terrible. Uh, uh, absolutely terrible. You see, you've got New York. Um, I've watched some hurricanes in the past uh, and where they got a bit further north into New York. And they're saying this is climate change. Blah, 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 blah. And the, the mayors are all making a big song and dance about it. They, they they really ought to be hit on the head with an encyclopedia or something because they don't know what they're talking about, right? They don't know what they're talking about. So in answer to your question, I've just shown you the graph of showing hurricanes slightly reducing. The exact opposite. Ask me any other critical question. I love people having tried to challenge me and ask questions which try to disprove what I'm saying. That's the best for all for me, those questions. So right. ask another yeah, well, that that is the the kind of the narrative that I'm hearing when I'm looking at at uh, legacy media. The, the idea Correct. is that this thing went from nothing, and it's because of climate change that this hurricane intensified so much and hit Acapulco and did the damage. Yeah. Exactly um, what I've dealt with. Exactly what I've dealt with. What happened was about about eight days, nine days ago, on this GB News channel, which is a national news channel, uh, they had an alarmist on, and I was so upset because they had a storm on. They said, "Yeah." There's the fingerprint of climate change. And he said, it's like a bowl, like a bath. And in normal times, you can fill it up and down. But the climate change does the extra bit, and the extra bit floods you. That's the difference. So there's climate change, which is nonsense. So he quoted, they picked up the heat on the hottest record in on, on a record temperature on the sea for the few days. It doesn't work like that, see? And in land, yes? Well, he also referred to the hottest record in Britain on temperature. So what I did was I showed I showed him up. I took his channel. This is what got me on television. I, I took his channel and I said the hottest record in Britain, the temperature of 42, was taken on Heathrow Airport at the runway with the jets passing by. And the second one, let's go to the second hottest, Coningsby, 
Coningsby Airport, where we have RAF tornadoes taking off. And it was taken just after the tornado took off. Really? I said, why don't you put an electric fire in your lounge or in your office and take a temperature measurement two feet away and declare that as a new record? Right. Why don't you do that? Right. So I was doing things like that. So and then I went to the I went to the Canary Islands where it's meant to pick up heat and it said land and sea. So I looked at the land and, and it was 32 for that. It was hot to that time. And I looked back at the records in 1951. It was 44. So it wasn't a record, was it? And, and, and they said near record. Well, what's a near record? And you, you get records all the time now announced to you, but they're not. They're lying. And they change the data. Tony Hellas, I chose this all the time they change the data to to lie about the new record and they are doing that intentionally and i've got no respect for them for doing that none at all it's called homogenization if you people have heard of the grand canyon and if you took a measurement you can uh what do you call them and louise or something you can drive over the grand canyon yes and yes if you go 100 yards out from the edge you're going to drop to the bottom yes so if you take a temperature at the bottom of the grand canyon and you take a temperature at the top there's a big difference now, what does that mean if you're trying to get global temperatures? Because this has got a much higher pressure as well at the bot bottom. At the bottom, it's much worse because you've got a, a mile, another mile of air on you. Yes. So so you have to allow for the things like that, obviously. But little details I go into, like ocean temperatures, used to be taken by two ways. The engine intake, where you have to bring the water in to cool the engine, they'd measure it there. So that's measured normally they plan a big ship. It's measured 10 or 15 feet to eight feet down where the water intake is. It's got to be below the lowest water line. And, and they also measure if I put the bucket over the side of the rope and bring it aboard, leaving it there a bit, measuring it. So we just had some famous, uh, some terrific Irish scientists. And they took the historic data on this and they took the ones that were measured that way by the bucket and they took by the engine now if you take by the engine you get the 1930s you get the dust bowl you get the proper thing right if you take it by the bucket you don't right so which one's more accurate the one that measures it electronically if you like as it sucks it in right from the sea that's what's coming into the engine or a bucket a sailor told every day to go and do this boring job with a bucket he gets a bit of water up leaves it there you know oh god there was my thermometer and then takes the temperature you know one is more accurate than the other and so you have to look into, they're called the Connollys, the people. There. There's a whole family of scientists in Dublin. So, um, and they're terrific. Yeah, terrific people. They've just come up with some fantastic. They have done this homogenization examination. And it's unbelievable. There's, um, in the in the States, um, there was a lot of arguments about this, way right back in about early 2000s, because it stopped cooling. So um, th there was, a, there was a, a bloke called Watt. I think he was called Watt. Uh, he was an American bloke. And he pointed out that, you know, the urban heat island effect uh, in the city of, city of a city, now 10 degrees warmer than the outside. Right. So he he went around photographing gauges, temperature gauges you know, on, on, on Stevenson screens, they're called. And there was one by a university which they use. Now, when it was originally put up, it was in a field. Now it's in the middle of a car park. Yeah. So and they still <laughs> use it. And then he went to another one. And there's a building we build up alongside it, and the air conditioning unit blowing out the hot air is five feet away. So, so then, then they they claimed, um, well, you know, it, it's getting hotter. Well, it is, yeah, it is getting hotter there, yeah. So let's do something. Let's put up a hundred perfect stations that are really balanced to give us a USA proper average temperature. And they did a great job. Triple redundancy, even the latest technology. They put up 100 stations. Yeah. 2005. And they measured the temperatures since. The only problem was it shows no warming. Hmm. Right. So the, it's called the standard reference network. Uh, and that's it. Then there's the, 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 the alarmist people do a study, do a study for IPCC and everything. And they do and they divide America into six zones. And then they do the prediction. Is it going to get warmer or cooler in each zone? Right? Now, on average, if you predicted and you kept repeating it and you didn't know, just random, you'd get three right, three wrong, wouldn't you? You've got to guess six times, one way or the other. Okay. Yeah? So th this re this paper was based on a certain average time and it went to a reviewer. You know, had to review the paper. And he was, uh, he's a great man because he was honest. So he looked at it and said, hold on. So he said... You've only managed to get, when you compare it again by happened, you've got one out of six right. 
On random, you get half of them right. <laughs> You've only got one out of six. So he, he sent this off and said, I have to reject it. The work's wrong. So he gets back and they said, hold on. So he gets a letter back. And he's written a book on this, right? He's written a book on it. And uh, this is an American scientist. And, and he said, they said, it's actually worse than that because you took a 10-year average. Well, we've taken a one-year average, a two-year, everything. We've taken every average. And you're right all the way through. Doesn't matter how you do it. We only get one in six right. He said, oh, good. So you're going to withdraw the paper. Oh, no, no, we can't withdraw the paper. Oh, no, no, we can't. So it then becomes intentional fraud. And they didn't. And they couldn't politically withdraw the paper. Right? That's awful. Now, That's so awful. bad was that, that the man wrote the book on it. And I feature it in a video. So I tell the story in a video because instead of you having to buy the book, yeah, you know, books worth reading, don't get me wrong, but instead of you having to buy the book and pick it up and do that, I, uh, you, you simply, you simply watch my video and you know the story. Don't believe me, buy the book. Wonderful. Yeah, you can download it from Amazon. Wonderful. All right, then. So a producer, I'll give you another story. A producer, I'm sorry for going on, but a producer had an idea. Why don't we put Paul Burgess in the London Palladium, which is a famous theatre in London, right, uh, on stage with two climate alarmists, with a climate alarmist, and it was Dr. Lawrence Krauss, who, with Richard Dawkins and all that, you know, quite famous, and he just got the best-selling book called The Physics of Climate Change. So you debate him, Paul. Will you debate him? Yes, I said, right? So I go on to a Zoom call with Lawrence Krauss, and, and now don't forget, the foundation of all modern alarmism is the hockey stick. That changed in two years, everything, yeah? So we're talking, and I said, I'm not disputing your maths. What's wrong is your data? And he said, I don't know my data, Paul. I just accept my data. So I said, that's what's wrong. And he said, well, I've got another professor, the one who came up with Snowball, uh, Dan Schmidt or somebody, and can we have another Zoom call? But he'd never heard of the hockey stick, and I was shattered. This man who's just right there, I'd never heard of the hockey stick. That's like saying, I've never been told that cars have wheels. Yeah. yeah. Drive somewhere. What's this wheel? What's that? That's, to me, it's like that. So they brought on Dan for the next Zoom call. And then I said, Dan, you, you know, you've got evidence like the Black Spruce Forest, 80 miles north of the medieval warm period. Because for the alarmist to work, there's no Little Ice Age. There's no medieval warm period. It's all been done away with by the hockey stick. Yeah. So they've got to have that line maintained. Yeah. And he said, oh, it could be the jet stream changing. Well, the jet stream changes by the day almost. You know, ask any pilot where the jet stream is at that time when they take off. It's important. Yes. If it comes down and does a dip, you get these big problems. Or you get the big heat waving in, in Canada, the big zoning of big heat a few years back, which was caused, a well-known meteorological event, caused by a downrushing of wind. Cause, it causes a sudden pressure of wind down the slope. And like pumping up a tyre for a cycle, the pump gets hot. The pressure compression temporarily heats it up for a day or two. That is a naturally known event. No, no, it's dressed up as a big issue. Yes, when you look at it, but the damage has been done because the kids and the public who don't spend their life like me examining these lies get the lie. Uh, and then it leaves people like me to pick up the bits. And that's what I do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually thinking about it as a sort of refuse collector. <laughs> I go around with all the climate alarms and refuse and trying to reassemble it and show you that it's actually a lie, but it's right. It is rubbish. I, I love what you're doing. It ties in with something that I, I recently heard. I know it's been said for years, but I want to believe as many true things as possible and disbelieve as many untrue things as possible. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a good attitude for everyone to go into to life yes. with. That's uh, mm -hmm. That's, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. I've been wrong so many times. It's wonderful. I can then learn something new and change, right. you know, change I what like I, my outlook. I like being wrong. Uh, yeah. it doesn't, the scientific process is about being wrong. Like that professor up in Durham University for cosmology, who's so excited the fact they've all been wrong. Okay, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so on. And they have, the problem is there wasn't time for the galaxy to be there and be that size so close to the beginning of the universe or the Big Bang. And now they're saying galaxies must have existed at the same time as the Big Bang, which meant the Big Bang was just an event in an older universe. And it's quite exciting. I'm not saying that's the case, by the way, because yeah. I'm not a cosmologist and I haven't looked into it. But those are the questions now being asked. Yes. Right. And it's all because we put up a telescope called James Webb, I think, 
and it can look back further than the previous one. Yeah, because when you look back, because time, light takes time to travel. When you look back, you're looking back into the past. You're looking right. back to, uh, 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 and so that's that. So um, uh, you know, and I'm willing to. I, uh, someone had an idea. Put a sign behind me, put me outside Oxford University, Trinity College, and challenge the professors to debate me. G give a chair, an empty chair. And I did that for a whole day, sitting there. They wouldn't debate me. Right? I had a 19-year-old, I had a 19-year-old come up and been brainwashed. So I, I said to him, all I'm doing now is like a detox, you know, of 19 years <laughs> information. And uh, he couldn't believe me when I was saying things. He just couldn't believe. And I said, go and check it now. You know. So like, how should that work? How should it work in the in this in the scientific method when somebody says uh, I, I have a, a friend who's a conspiracy enthusiast uh, and yeah. he doesn't believe that there are germs and he, he believes many of you know oh. other people say the flat earth and but nobody will debate the person who says that there's no such thing as germs or a virus or whatever. I and, had I sorry. How does how should this happen when somebody comes up with something that is not the norm and says, wait a minute, I think you guys all have it wrong. What is the proper process in the academia? Who sh who is it that should be debating you? Who should step up and say, oh, I'll take this guy on? The people who have countering evidence should then be an open debate with you. You should answer every point they make and they should answer every point you make. I had a meeting once and at the end, a flat earther came up to me. Yeah. And he said, look, and he said, from London, from London to uh, Florida, they don't fly straight. Oh, no, no. They fly on this. So I said, yes, yeah, right. And he said, because and flat earth. Yeah. And I said, sit down. So I then, in a great circle to him, I said, it's actually the shortest route they take. No, no, it's a curve. I said, if you get a, a, a rugby ball or what you would call a football, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you get a rugby ball. And you then turn it towards me. So I'm looking straight down at London, right? And I see New York there or Florida there with me. And I draw a straight line. That's where I'm flying. But when I turn that rugby ball this way to look at it, that straight line's a curve. Are you with me? So and you're looking at a flat piece of paper, right? You're looking at that rugby ball turned that way. So I always try to I always try to explain everything that way. It's actually called the Great Circle. It's the distance. It's the center of the Earth to the but, but the two points, and the shortest distance is always the straight line between the two. Yeah, right. Well, I I really hope that some people will. Uh, you had one the other day. You had a debate. That's good. I hope more and more people will step forward, and uh, the truth will come out of that. Um, what <laughs> haven't I asked you that I should have, Paul? That's a good question, that because I'm a, I'm a big mouth, I go spouting on for ages, only because I'm excited about the subject. <laughs> what should you have asked me? Um, well, I don't make any money out of it. You could ask me, am I am I financed by the fossil fuel industry? No. Um, do I lose money on doing this? Yes, I, it costs me. It, it, even when I go to, even when my expenses are paid, they're not all paid. So when I fly to the airport to go to the European country, no one's paid for my four days parking. No one's paid for me driving a long distance to and back from the thing. When I go to give talks, most of the time the expenses aren't covered at all because people can't afford it. So my hotel and everything's on me. Um, so I get no money. I, I, I've been accused of that, of course, but no evidence because anyone can, you know, I can say that actually you're not human. You're actually a reptile talking to me, pretending to be a human. And uh, I could waste my time trying to, you could waste your time trying to prove that's not true. You know, sometimes to prove it, you, sometimes you can't prove a negative. Um, it depends. I mean, on the, I can, on the flat earth, I could prove it. But sometimes you can't prove a negative. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I hate conspiracy theorists. And I was wrong about I was wrong about uh, the subject on COVID. I was. I uh, and a friend of mine was a conspiracy theorist on it. And um uh, and they were right and I was wrong. Uh, because um how can you possibly argue to inject babies with that when they're not in danger at all? You can't. So I don't have to go past that. I really don't have to go past that. And um, I, I have I have moral stances, and I know this will upset a lot of people. I, I don't believe, for example, in the death penalty, right? But I do believe in whole life terms. And the reason I don't believe in the death penalty is a lot of innocent people have been harmed 
uh, or electrocuted a lot. And if I believe in it, I've got to be willing that if it's me wrongly accused, if it's me sitting in the chair ready to be electrocuted, I'd say, well, it's fair enough to do this to get the guilty ones. And now uh, that's 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 where my argument ends. You can have these have big long discussions on television about it. Yeah, I end it there. You know, I'm not willing to do that. And that's where I stand. Yeah. Yep. Good. And uh, uh, if I knew, if uh, it can never be certain because humans are involved, but if there was absolute in some dream world proof the person had maliciously murdered and so on, I wouldn't object to it. But do you understand me? So so that's where I'm I do it. And I do that with a number of things. So I was wrong, and this lady who's not spoken to me since, because well, I contacted her afterwards and I said, you were right and I was wrong. I never believed that a pharmaceutical company could do this. I just couldn't believe they could do it. I know they're legally um, exempt you know, from any comeback, but um, it was done in the best intentions and so on, and it wasn't. So, um, so I uh, have been very wrong in the last few years on some subjects, and it's made me much more reluctant to... To, 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 you know to counter things and again i realized it wasn't just climate it's got nothing to do with my works nothing to do with climate it's to do with population control mm -hmm. and, and it's to do actually with um communism almost taking over the biggest finances of um british university are the chinese right so your department goes if you upset the chinese yeah yep. that's where we are so instead of it being fossil fuel for me, which is not true, the truth is that when you look at the investments being made the other way around and the way it's crept into everything, you know, and so, um, I mean, I'm, we have what we call Poppy Day, which is we've had all the, all the wars, the first, second world war and all the others, and, and we celebrate our, our, our veterans with a poppy because that poppies grew on the fields of Flanders in France. And, um, and we have a senator. And we have a lot of old soldiers, very few of them left from those wars now with all their medals on and everything. And next weekend, I'm supposed to be, I think, in London, you know, and there's a million people turning up um, against it, basically, uh, you know, right? And uh, and I feel terrible about that. Uh, 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 and I don't commit violence, nor do I advocate violence under any sort to anybody, right? And I pick on no religion or race, Right. Some of them are more delusional than others, you know, and, and I know this upsets people. I'm an atheist. I'm not even agnostic. I'm an atheist. But I would also protect the right of anyone to have their religion, right? Because I believe in free speech completely. Mm -hmm. So, there are, and, and so on. So, um, so you, you can do that, you know. Uh, and, um, and if you're wrong, like the bloke in America stood up telling me how God made the banana to that shape so he could hold it and all that. And it wasn't true because it was man made. And he didn't know that. It was quite funny. But um, you can do that. Uh, uh, just because he was wrong on that doesn't mean to say he's wrong on everything else. Right. But so, um, and I know America can be a religious place, so I'm trying to be careful here, but I've, I've got to be honest. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and I, I, I was told when I was selling my product in America that I should shut up about being an illegitimate American war child, which I, you know, I'm a war child from the Second World War. And um, my father was a captain, in, in the American army and he left, for, he was in D-Day and he survived it. Uh, I never knew him because when I found out who my father was, I was 44 and he was already dead. But he died a mile, a mile away from me in Dallas, <laughs> wow. which um, was very funny. So um, yeah, there's all these things. I've, got, I've had a very rich life. I'm pleased for it. I've had things, I've experienced things I won't mention that are really deplorable. You know, I've had really, really bad things happen to me done by other people. You know, even trying to kill me and killing themselves in the process, by the way, before they got to me because the bomb blew up, you know, things like that. So I've had extreme things happen. And um, uh, and so all I can be, do I sit back and watch society be trampled like this by a lie? And it is being trampled by a lie. Yep. Well, thank you for standing up and uh, doing your part to stop it. I hope that your grandkids are proud of you for being a, uh, being a person who stands up for what's, uh, what's right and true well, and searching for them, more truth. Uh, two or three of them are. The rest, <laughs> the rest thing granddad goes on about this thing I don't want to know about. So, <laughs> because the, the, the kids are in their own little world. But as they come into the older, the oldest is 17. Yes, he's proud uh, and so on. But uh, as you get younger, 
you know, um, their father stood by my machine in the office, my video machine, and showed one of them, showed a 12, 13 year old uh, lad and a 10 year old girl one of my videos. And so, what do you think of that? And afterwards, they were questioned. And my wife said, what, what was granddad saying? And the girl said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you're into that, and that's fair. I don't want to impinge on them, but I do want to correct the rubbish they're being told. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, and so that's life. That's what life is, you know. And and most people are like sheep. And I finish a lot of my videos. I bought a cartoon rights to a cartoon, and it's got a pile of sheep rushing off a bit deep cliff. So you imagine a vertical cliff, and there's a whole pile of sheep falling over. You know, ah, ah, ah. So I put the soundtrack on, and at the back there's one sheep saying. Hold on here, hold on here. And it's called an emergence of a leader, you know. And, uh, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, uh, and that's how I see it. That's really how I see it. It's quite funny. <laughs> and in fact, I made a video of a real sheep being herded with a farmer and lots of sheepdogs, about eight, seven or eight sheepdogs threw a hole into another field. So I put on um, the IPCC, I put on covid i put on all sorts of things around it controlling the sheep controlling the population and i replaced the dogs so i animated these things the same piece as the dogs so as yeah. this thing moved in, people moved away and and that and that's how i'm finishing my talk in in the parliament with, 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 this, with, with this because um, i don't get onto population control until the last 60, 60 seconds and i say i'm going to actually cover the control in 60 seconds and the shepherds are the big organizations, the WHO, the IPCC, the UN. I mean, the UN are terrible. And uh, and the, the, the UN, which basically like America finances this this cis in, in, in your in your in your, inside your country, uh, it's a cyst. It's terrible. And it's not up to do anything with the truth or anything. It's a lot to do with the transfer of wealth to third world countries. But you know, um if we want to help, and I really do want to help third world countries, you don't help them by making fossil fuels so expensive they can't use them. And you don't help them. And, and there's a perfect example. I can't stop coming. Sri Lanka, you know, the old Salon Sri Lanka, uh, their government went completely woke. They went complete. They banned fertilizers. And they overthrew the government because there was mass starvation. So they overthrew the government. So there's your classic, uh, there's your classic, uh, um, what's it called, canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. You've got the classic, you've got a country that went super green on climate and the population rose up and threw the government out. There was riots. Sri Lanka. And even if a person is so such a sociopath that they go along with the old Soviet Union idea of, you know, sometimes you to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs and we're really yes. doing this because we want the world to be better in the long run. Well, I think yeah. what I've heard from your work is that it doesn't mean there's going to be a better world in the long run. So even well, if you were so sadistic, you thought that was okay. It's still not a good argument. No, the plastic sign stop oil hold up, the clothes they're in, the zip, everything, oil. Yeah, everything, oil. Uh, they wouldn't have the phones. The phone, oil, right? plastic, oil. Plastic's one of the best inventions there's ever been. I tr oh, oh, by the way, I sailed through the, the big plastic ring in the Pacific, you know, the plastic rubbish dump? Yes. Doesn't exist. So now they say, because it's not there, they say it's so small that it'll broken down into tiny little bits and you can't see it. Like you, like they use polar bears that you, most people don't see. Like they use the Arctic, most people don't go to. Well, one thing I'll finish with, which, and I'm going to finish with this. I really have to finish. When you do the scientific work with the O2 being absorbed, what it shows when you, what that work shows, by the way, we do it in theory, then we measure it from satellite and it's the same. So we prove it. But when you come to the Antarctic, it's the other way around. In other words, the, the, the greenhouse gases increase they make it colder. So in the Antarctic, why do the greenhouse gases make it colder than it would otherwise be? And the reason is it's such a vast continent of cold that as you go up, unlike the rest of the world, it gets warmer, not colder. When you go up in aeroplanes, as you know, it gets very, very cold. Not the, yeah. not the Antarctic, as you go up, it gets warmer. It's called the Antarctic inversion. And the greenhouse gases help gather the heat and give it out to space. So greenhouse gases make the Antarctic older. So on my video, okay, that's the theory. It's checked against the it's checked against the satellite measurements. But let's what the measure the temperatures. So let's take this German study who did the terrestrial temperatures. Yeah, it's been cooling for 40 years. Hmm. So that's the sort of thing people don't know. Right. Right. I asked people, I was on a radio show and I asked people, uh, I asked a, a graduate in or he's taking a BSc in 
in climate and asked him how how many feet would the seas rise if the Arctic melted? Yeah. But the answer, by the way, is zero because it's floating ice. So when it melts, it doesn't add anything. And he, he, and he said, I don't know how many feet. Well, I know that he doesn't know, does he? So I said, well, give me a rough idea. Well, rough? Well, you know, thinking about it, so I had to stop the pain, I said. It doesn't rise at all. Yeah, The ice has to come from land. Another thing with that is they'll take you to see all these carving carving glaciers and things, yes, yeah. and carving. Right? And they say, it's terrible, it's terrible. Well, hold on. A glacier is a flowing river, just very slow. It's a flowing river of ice. The glacier, the, the carving is good because it shows it gets all the way there. If it wasn't, if it was warming up, it would have stopped halfway down and you'd be getting water. Yes. And those cycles are going on. In Greenland now, the main the main glaciers are extending over time. Go and see the Tony Heller website. So um, that's it. So Tom Nelson, Tony Heller, two great sites to get to go and see. And I'd like you to see mine as well, which is uh, Paul, Paul, uh, climate realism, if you put it wrong, climate realism by Paul Burgess. And um, and if I had to start people off on one video, actually, I'd start them off on it. Get, it's going to get colder. The journey of a climate skeptic, because I cover the cycles um, very well, I think, in that one. And um, but there's a number, you know, it depends on which aspect you're looking at. But it all links together into a big story. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Alan, with the opportunity to get to a few more people. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and for all of your energy. I really do appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.